This is the Multi-Faith Matters Podcast. I'm your host, John Morgan. Well, this is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I am the host, John Moorhead. And today, uh, in connection with uh, 9-11 and trying to provide a different resource for evangelicals and other Christians as we reflect on the trauma of that event for this country, my guest is Tom Pazinski. Tom, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah. Cool. Yes, good. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah, uh, for the Poland, it would be a little bit different, but that's sort of... Oh, of, of course. Yes, good. yes. Well, I uh, grabbed a bio from you from the uh, the internet, and I'll read some of that. And if you want to supplement, that's fine. Uh, Professor Tom Pazinski received his BA in psychology from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and his MA and PhD in social psychology from the University of Kansas. His research has been funded by the National Science Foundation since 1989. He received an Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship for collaborate, collaborative research with psychologists in Germany and several grants from the Dutch government for collaborative research with psychologists in the Netherlands. He and his colleagues have played a major role in the development of experimental existential psychology, an emerging subdiscipline of social psychology that applies rigorous experimental methods to the study of human confrontation with existential problems such as death, freedom, isolation, and nature. He teaches a variety of courses in social psychology. His research focuses primarily on terror management theory, which is what we're going to be talking about today, which he developed with colleagues Jeff Greenberg and Sheldon Solomon. Terror management theory is concerned with the role of self-esteem and cultural belief systems in providing protection against core human fears, especially the fear of death. Over the years, Professor Bozinski and colleagues have explored the role of terror management processes in a wide variety of topics. And I ran, ran across his book, uh, in the wake of 9-11, The Psychology of Terror that he co-authored with those colleagues mentioned previously. And we're going to unpack that today. Uh, Professor Pazinski, uh, welcome to the program. It's good to be here. <laughs> I appreciate you uh, responding to uh, the invitation in a positive way. Let me share with you and with the audience the background okay. for our conversation. Um, I work uh, in multi-faith engagement. I try to help evangelicals and other conservative Christians practice a more neighborly and hospitable way of relating to religious others, particularly those where there is uh, conflict and friction, such as the Muslim community. And a few years ago, uh, I pursued a couple of grants a, through the Louisville Institute. The first grant was uh, for three years, and we developed case studies of churches that were relating positively to religious others in their community. But at the end of that grant period, Questions arose for me as the grant leader as to why are these churches doing it differently? Why are they in the minority when most conservative Christians, particularly evangelicals, tend to either ignore uh, religious others or they tend to be negative and confrontational, particularly with certain religious communities like Muslims. And so we pursued a second supplemental book grant, and that brought social psychology and social neuroscience into conversation with theologies of multi-faith encounters. And during that process, I encountered things like terror management theory, and I found it very helpful in understanding the psychology of conservative Christians and evangelicals, uh, particularly in, uh, in, with a post 9-11 environment in mind. So uh, I, I would like to explore this terror management theory and help the audience, uh, listeners and viewers understand their own psychology perhaps the trauma related to post 9-11, so they can kind of step back a little bit and rethink how uh, these things might have shaped uh, their, their own understanding and relation to others uh, in their community and in the country. So that's kind of the, the background for this. How did you come to uh, develop an interest uh, professionally in terror management theory? Well, um, I don't know, back in the 1980s, uh, my colleagues and I came across the work of a cultural anthropologist, Ernest Becker, who wrote a number of books, but especially The Denial of Death. And uh, um, 
friends from grad school, uh, Sheldon Solomon and Jeff Greenberg. Uh, and I started talking about this book and deciding that it um, sort of filled in the blanks in some way in, 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 in our field. And some of the ideas, you know, the ideas that Becker talked about were not being discussed prior to, you know, us getting involved in this. And one of the, uh, the, the most striking things is that psychologists, at least research oriented psychologists, really didn't deal with the role that death plays in life. And that's what terror management theory is all about. It's how death affects us. And actually, you know, I remember reading this book myself and not liking it, sort of arguing against him every page through. And at some point it struck me, it's really interesting. I'm finding this so, you know, so disturbing and I'm so against it. And it struck me that maybe these ideas were sort of touching a nerve that uh, was uh, affecting me in some ways that I hadn't been aware of. Uh, I gave a, a little definition that I found on some of the uh, internet materials that is yeah. associated with the work that you do in terms of terror management theory. How would you define it? Can we define that a sure. little more broadly? Well, yeah, you know, there's a lot to say there. Yeah. And in, in, in a nutshell, uh, terror management theory deals with the role that death plays in life. And the um, basic idea is that we human beings, um, you know, look at it from a variety of perspectives, but we're born with a desire to stay alive. And all of the biological systems of our bodies, our heart, our lungs, our kidneys, liver, pretty much everything in our body is function is to keep us alive. And there are also psychological systems that mo do motivate us to do things to stay alive too, like find food, water, avoid danger and so on. But um, we humans, um, have uh, sophisticated intellectual abilities that no other animals have that make us aware that uh, death is inevitable and that no matter what we do, we're going to die someday. So other animals fear clear and present dangers to their lives. So for example, my dogs outside, uh, if it smells a bear, live in the mountains, you know, he really freaks out. He gets very upset. Uh, but when he's laying in the sun, he's completely, you know, there's nothing. He, he's not aware of a future. He doesn't have ideas. Uh, he's not aware that he's going to die. And he's pretty, you know, <laughs> he's a little happier than we are because of that. Uh, unfortunately, human beings know that they're going to die. And it's, it's, a, it's a result of our intelligence. And that awareness of the inevitability of death clashes with our desire for life to create this potential for terror. And the idea is that humankind um, solve the problem of terror by using their intelligence to come up with ideas that um, manage that fear. Uh, and that's what we refer to as cultural worldviews. Cultural worldviews are sort of the sum total of our beliefs about reality. And the idea is that um, knowing we're going to die affected the kinds of ideas that early humans found, you know, thought of and found interesting and appealing and other people liked them and they eventually spread and became part of our worldviews. So cultural worldviews do a number of things. They um, give meaning to life. They give structure and order to our experience. Um, they also provide uh, a set of standards for what a good person is like. And all cultures have these standards of value. Um, you know, it's good to be strong. It's good to be fast. It's good to be kind. It's good to be loving. It's good to be caring. Um, many of these values are universal just because they help people get along. And then some of them are a little more specific from culture to culture. So for example, um, you know, different religions have different beliefs about God, about the origins of life, about what is good and what is evil. Although actually most you know, religions, the religions that have survived and that are around today share more values than they, they differ on. Okay, so the idea then is that if we have 
confidence or faith in our worldview and, and believe that it's the way things really are, and we live up to the standards of the worldview, which gives us self-esteem, that creates sort of a shield or buffer against the things we're afraid of and the anxiety or potential for anxiety that results from knowing we're gonna die. Now, let me see, does that, does that make sense at this point? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're afraid of death. And so uh, this, this is a psychological response. And if I'm hearing you correctly, within that is not only the fear of physical death and the desire for life, but wrapped up in that is also these cultural worldviews and the fear of the death of our cultural worldview that yeah. the other threatens that. Is that correct? Yeah. And th there's another part that's really important in understanding how people deal with those who are different from themselves. And this is the idea that um, our beliefs and values are ideas, you know, and there are a lot of them around and a lot of different ones around. So what gives people confidence that their views are true and correct is when other people share those beliefs and values. So for example, you know, like one, you know, and this is the way people think and the, the way we understand reality. So for example, if you're in a room and you start feeling really, really warm, um, you might mention that and say, you know, gosh, is it warm in here? And if everyone else says, yeah, you interpret that as a validation of your perception that the room is actually warm. But if you're feeling very warm and everyone else says, no, actually I'm getting a little cold and they start pulling off their sweaters, that invalidates your perception and causes you to question it. You might think, well, maybe I'm getting sick or maybe there's something wrong with me. Maybe, I don't know, it, it just challenges your belief. Another example. Uh, okay, right now, I'd like to believe that I'm making sense, you know what I mean? I'd like to believe that these are, are, are decent ideas. And, you know, if you're nodding like you are now, you know, I'd say, okay, I'm making sense. But if as I'm talking, you're shaking your head and waving your fist, it's a little harder for me to be confident that the world is the way we think it is, or that my ideas are making sense. So this need for validation from other people is a very deep one. And it's something that many of us won't admit. A lot of us think that, no, I, I, you know, I base my beliefs on my own reading of things. Um, you know, decades of research show that people are heavily influenced by others. And that's why we like to be around other people who share our beliefs and we like people so if you and I are talking about something, I don't know, let's suppose we're talking about the NBA championship and you thought, I don't know if you followed it all, but you thought the, the Bucks did a great job. I'm from Milwaukee. I'd, I'd like you more, right? <laughs> and, and if you said, nah, you know, it was a fluke. They were lucky. They got, you know, unfair calls. Uh, even though we're getting along in other ways, that would create a bit of a wedge. So that's one of the issues with people dealing with those who are different um, is the idea that whether we realize it or not, we rely on other people to increase our confidence and certainty or faith in our beliefs and values. And when other people share those beliefs, we like them and it strengthens our beliefs. But when other people have different ways of thinking, it raises the possibility that maybe our way isn't the right way. Now, we don't experience it that way. We experience that as an increase in emotion, negative emotion, what we call anxiety, because that firm confidence or faith in our beliefs is what protects us from fear. So what happens when people are different is the mere existence of people who are different raises the possibility of other ways of being and other realities, other, you know, the possibility that their way might not be any, our, our women may not be any better than theirs. So it creates, it creates this negative emotion that we diffuse by putting those people down. So if they are ignorant savages, if they are brainwashed by uh, 
charismatic lunatic leaders. You know, if they're following, if Osama bin Laden has them under their, their, his spell, for example, and has somehow fooled them, that diffuses that difference. It makes it okay again. My entry point into uh, terror management theory was through social, social psychology and moral foundations theory. Yeah. Uh, specifically through the work of Jonathan Haidt. And my operating yeah. theory in trying to understand the evangelical psyche was discussed. Um, that when evangelicals consider, there's some interesting research papers I found, even just thinking about uh, the Quran or the, the doctrine no. of another religion, they tend to feel like their purity is, is somehow threatened or, or the possibility of compromise there. Does terror management theory work and overlap with other areas of, of psychology? Sure. You know what um, moral foundations theory claims is that our that we have these deeply rooted moral intuitions or gut feelings that evolve to help people live together in small groups. So that if we are caring, if we're fair, if we avoid harming other people, if we respect authority, what else? If we um, are, if we favor people who are part of our group, for people who are different groups, from different groups, that all kind of is useful because it helps us get along together and live and survive in groups. Um, and one of the other things she suggests is that these gut level reactions were then sort of customized by culture, that as hmm, history progressed, as human life moved forward, we began thinking about these things and, and coming up with, uh, and we sort of elaborated on them and refined them and made them specific to our people. Um, terror management theory suggests that one of the driving forces in that was awareness of death and the potential for anxiety that, that served. And that once we became sort of intelligent uh, and self-aware, the fear of death led us to attach meaning to those gut feelings. Um, there's sort of a biblical parallel, I don't know, I'll try out on you guys. Um, uh, it, it's in Genesis. Uh, in Genesis, when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of knowledge, they became, you know, one way of thinking about that is it's, 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 a, it's a sort of a, a way of talking about this transition from being animals to being intelligent, self-conscious beings. The tree of knowledge in Genesis talks about eating this fruit will make you knowledgeable like a God. And that knowledge could be thought of as making people aware of death, driving them you know, out of paradise into a world where the real problem is they were aware that they were going to die, that they had bodies that had were fragile and that, uh, you know, could break or get sick or eventually will die and decay. I don't know, I'm not sure if that really fits our narrative here, but I throw that in. Yeah, I appreciate you trying to connect the dots there. Um, let's talk about terror management theory as it relates to 9-11. Uh, America has had, over the course of its history, various traumatic national experiences that have impacted the psyche for a prior generation. Uh, one of those was uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, more recently is 9-11. Uh, is How did the trauma of 9-11 deeply scar and impact the psyche of American culture? Shortly after the attacks, we started seeing people, you know, psych psychologists on internet blogs, talking about how this sounds like terror management theory. And we got really involved in this and wrote the 9-11 book. But the basic idea is that what... Um, 9-11 did was it provided a very dramatic reminder of death and our vulnerability. Um, on that day, 3,000 people went to work as an ordinary day and they didn't come home. And it just reminded us of how fragile life is and how quickly it can end. And at the same time, and, and of course, you know, this is something we were you know, the event was part of it, but also, you know, because it was so dramatic, you know, for weeks, every time you turned on the television, you would see a replay 
of the planes crashing into the towers and people running and crying and screaming and interviews with people who lost loved ones. So not only was that event dramatic, but it was so dramatic that it was constantly part of our awareness. At the same time, uh, this attack reminded us of the fragility of our culture. Um, it was committed by 19 guys with box cutters and they were basically able to take down the most powerful nation in history for several weeks and scar us, I think to this day. Mm -hmm. we, we, the way it happened and how relatively simple it was, was sort of terrifying. Um, again, a reminder of the vulnerability, how easily things could go. And these guys were doing these things because they believed that America was evil and deserving of punishment. Now, you know, very, almost none of us think that way, but the idea that some people could do this and in the name of their God, you know, I, I think a, in a horrible misreading of Islam, thinking that this was a justified vengeance for evils of our country was a big challenge to our worldview. Um, it was sort of a, uh, on the one hand, a reminder of death, and on the other hand, an attack on our culture and our self-esteem as a people in the sense that this could be done to us relatively simply. It was very easy to imagine it happening again. Um, so the idea is this discombobulated Americans and led us to do a lot of things to try to shore up um, our faith in America and the American way of life and belief system and, 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 and push away that anxiety and fear. Um, so one of the things we did is we became more patriotic. We, want, we waved the flag, we, we talked about um, you know, it, it brought Americans together in a way that I, I don't think anyone has seen since. I, I would like to see, I don't wanna see another terrorist attack, but I'd like to see Americans united like we were shortly after 9-11. It led people to want to live up to their values. It led to a, uh, an increase in charitable giving uh, for about six months, uh, both to 9-11 related causes, but to all sorts of other kinds of causes. Uh, church attendance, increased for about six months. Um, and on the other side, there was a reaction against those people who saw the world differently. And one of the things that people do when they're afraid is they cling more to stereotypes of other people. Um, and there was a tendency to overgeneralize and think that the action of this, uh, these 19 guys and the thousands of people were, I don't know how many people were involved in Al Qaeda. Uh, and, and, and it, you know, there is a, a, I guess, sort of a, a radical, dangerous stream of Islam that teaches that this is a, way, a good way of being, which is a minority view, represent everyone. Uh, so there's this tendency to stereotype and want to distance and sort of put those people down. Um, you know, I, I, in terms of thinking about stereotypes, what I like to suggest to people is they think about a group they belong to for which there's a stereotype. So for example, there are stereotypes about evangelical Christians, right? And some of them aren't very pretty. And you know, and I know that doesn't describe all evangelical Christians. It certainly doesn't describe all Christians, but a lot of people believe that. And especially when we're afraid, we need that simplicity in understanding the other in a way that makes us superior, us the moral ones, the other ones the bad ones. So we all belong to some category for which there are stereotypes. And we know, you know, because we're talking to evangelical Christians, let's think about that. You know, we know that there are some evangelical Christians that, um, I don't know, favor, in Colorado Springs, a guy you know, carrying a crucifix went in and killed four people at an abortion clinic. 
you know, regardless of what you think about abortion, I don't think, I'm sure the vast majority of evangelicals would see that as, 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 a, as a terrible thing to do. That becomes part of the stereotype, right? right. Uh, unfair, out of touch with reality, but it's the way the mind works. So um, one of the things that happened in response to 9-11 was this increased stereotyping of Muslims, lumping them all together and seeing them as more different from us than they are and more evil than, and, and evil. And at some point, before we finish, I'd like to talk about some studies I did with um, an interesting group, a psychologist from Iran and a psychologist from Israel. And you know, so we had a Muslim, Christian, or a Jew and Christian working, and a couple of Christians working together on this project, looking at um, some of the things that increase and decrease hostility between the groups. Yeah. We might not um, be ready to get there yet, but it's really relevant. Yeah, let me just interject a comment and some thoughts. If you want to give me some feedback on that, you can, or we could just talk about those studies. In my research, looking at terror management theory, some of the materials, it, this wasn't related to terror management theory, but I connected the dots. There's a, a, a scholar of religion. I hope I, every time I mention him, I hope I pronounce his last name correctly. Richard Simino, C-I-M-I-N-O. And he looked, yeah. he looked at materials that evangelicals were producing on Islam pre and post 9-11. Pre 9-11, they tended to write about Islam as another religion that needs to be evangelized by Christians. Post 9-11, there was a dramatic turn where it was very dark, it was satanic, it may not even be considered a religion, it's just a political system that wants to dominate the world. And what was the change? It was the event of 9-11, it wasn't the encounter with Muslims, it was that traumatic uh, blow there and that the trauma and the, the terror management kind of thing. So as I look at Christianity post 9-11, um, some things kind of jump out at me. There's the case of the Reverend David Benke, wasn't evangelical, was a Christian minister. He was invited to an interfaith prayer service in Yankee Stadium just days after 9-11. He was for a time excommunicated from his denomination because of his participation in that interfaith service. So he paid a tremendous price for that. He was eventually reinstated. Uh, more recently, there was a professor at Wheaton College, Larisha Hawkins, uh, uh, an African-American female professor who took a stand of solidarity with Muslims um, around the Christmas season. And she was eventually uh, booted from uh, the institution. And, and the charge there was syncretism and compromise as well. So as I look at terror management theory, I really think Christians tend to double down on worldview defense as a result of the psychological trauma that they've experienced. Is that a, a fair assessment of some application? Of well, I think many do, but I don't think all do. Right, of and course I not. think there are some aspects of the teachings of Jesus that if people are paying attention to, it would, would, would prevent them from going in that direction. Um, maybe this might, you know, I, I, I might be a good time to talk about these studies. Yes, let, let's do that. Let's, let's, Israel, let's talk about the problem. What, what kinds of things can we learn from some studies well, to work through the, you know, the problem? After 9-11, you know, we wrote the book about, you know, the psychology of terror. And I started attending conferences pretty much in the United States and Europe with, uh, lots of different kinds of people. And um, one, okay, before we get to that, it, what happened is um, shortly after 9-11, um, people started doing studies looking at how people remind, react when they're reminded of death. And basically the, there, there are hundreds of studies showing that when people are reminded of death, they're not aware of that this happens. But what they do is they become more negative and hostile towards people who are different in any meaningful way and more positive and accepting of people who share their beliefs and values. So um, uh, this Iranian psychologist wrote me saying, you know, it's really interesting that uh, Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, was a major enemy of Iran. Iran was the country that Saddam actually did use chemical weapons against. And this guy, I said, you know, I don't know anyone that doesn't have a family member who was hurt or killed 
in the war with Iraq. Yet Iranians were rallying around Saddam, their enemy, when the United States went to war with Iraq. And he thought, he says, that's really amazing. So we thought we'd start doing some research. So we did a study in which um, people were uh, randomly assigned to be reminded of death or something else negative that uh, is not gonna kill you like getting a root canal. And then they read an interview with a student at their university, something we actually wrote, it was sort of a bogus interview, but we, it's an approach we use in our research. And in one condition, this guy said, you know, my goal in life is to help people understand that Islam is a peaceful religion. I don't agree with a lot of things the Americans have done, but Allah teaches us never to kill other people or ourselves. That's not what Islam is about. And the other condition, we read an interview that was similar in superficial ways, but the guy says, my goal in life is to become a Sahid, a suicide bomber. Uh, the United States uh, has insulted us and our God so many times that my goal in life is to kill Americans, okay? Without the death reminders, the peaceful student who was opposed to terrorism, wanted peace, was much preferred. They liked him more and people agreed with him more. But after being reminded of death, they liked the terrorist, violent, war-supporting student. So reminders of death increased their attraction to someone who wanted to promote war. Mm. At the same time, our colleague in Israel was, and we were all independent initially, but he was doing studies showing reminders of death, increased support for uh, harsh, aggressive, violent tactics against the Palestinians by the Israeli army and increased hostility towards Israel, Israelis among Palestinians. And we were doing a study showing that, and this was true primarily among fundamentalist Christians, that reminders of death increased support for war and extreme measures to fight terrorism. So for example, and it's interesting, this only occurred among fundamentalists, but reminders of death increased support for using nuclear weapons, for using chemical weapons, agreement with the statement that if it would kill bin Laden, it would be okay to kill 10,000 Muslims, okay? So what, was, what struck us is that reminders of death was increasing support for terrorism in Iran, uh, harsh military strategies in Israel and war in the United States. Mm. The same thing at a deep level, the same thing that makes them want to kill us makes us want to kill them. So anyway, now we get to the interesting part. I think that's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But at these conferences, people would say, you know, and, and these were often people of faith um, from, the Muslim world or Israel or, or Christians in, in Europe were saying, isn't it amazing that these three religions that, you know, the core message is compassion, caring, and peace. And in, you know, in many religious texts, there are contradictory messages. There's some Old Testament stuff that doesn't go along with that. There's some stuff in the Quran that doesn't go along with that. That doesn't seem very prominent at all in the New Testament. But anyway, we thought that's really interesting. And we thought, well, what if we reminded people of the teachings about love and compassion that come from their faith? So we did a study in the United States where we asked people you know, before doing our study, or as part of the study, they were asked some questions about whether they agreed with some um, of the teachings from, um, from Matthew. I think it was from the Sermon on the Mount. Things like, they were fairly, you know, fairly classic New Testament quotes, like judge not lest ye be judged. If a man hits you, hits you, turn the other cheek, love your enemy, these kinds of things. And uh, in another condition, they were given, quotes from the Bible that didn't have anything to do with compassion. And of course, everybody agreed with all these things, right? Um, they said, yeah, I mean, absolutely, I agree, I believe. This is the way we should be. Well, when 
this, when they first were asked to affirm their belief in these compassionate teachings from Jesus, the reminders of death no longer had that effect. It had no effect on hostility towards people who are different. And we did a similar study in Iran where we took some parallel quotes from the Quran about compassion. One of them is um, be compassion because Allah is compassionate and he loves compassion. And again, Muslims would all agree with that. And after reading that, reminders of death actually reduced their support for any kind of hostility towards the West. So the idea is that there are core teachings in all of these religious traditions about compassion and love and caring and not doing harm. And that when people are reminded of those things, it takes away that tendency towards, towards hostility. And there are other things along those lines, for example, reminding people of the, the shared humanity that we all have in common, our families, our children, our parents, our grandchildren, is another thing that reduces hostility. Reminding people of the shared problems that all humans face could do that. Um, so, you know, we were motivated to do those studies because there was a lot of discussion about how is it that religion is fueling these wars. And there were prominent military leaders, uh, religious figures around that time were saying, you know, we're gonna win because our God is the real God and their God is, is, is not. And this was being said in, in the Islamic countries as well, I'm sure in Israel. And the point being that when you remind people of of these basic values of compassion, which I believe really are central to, I don't know, what I consider Christianity. And, and I think most Christians would say, yeah, I, I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. um, you don't get that hostility. The problem is when the other is different, that is that challenge to our way of being out of awareness. People aren't aware of it, but when they're reminded of people who are different, they're their confidence, their comfort levels goes down. So you could, one way of the way I like to think about it is that the compassionate teachings of most of the world's major religions, you find this in Buddhism, you find this in Hinduism as well, um, are messages that are aimed at helping people get along and um, reducing conflict. And, and, when, you know, and they, they can have that very positive impact. They don't always have that impact because the other side of it is when you have a world with multiple religions and multiple belief systems, there's this tendency you don't want to say, well, mine is right. If mine is right, yours must be wrong. And if mine is right and I'm good, you must be evil. Right, right. You know, one other thing I'd like to say about this is, I, I, again, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts about this. Uh, and I've, I've asked... Uh, a priest and imam about this. And, uh, you know, do you think it's better to think of re, uh, the world religions as being competing gods where there's one truth and everything, everyone else is wrong? Where, you know, if, if you think about, you know, like 50,000 years where human had the, had to, where religions began, um, you know, like there's one, one, one that's right and all the others are nonsense, or might it be that people in different parts of the world in different time came to know this God in different ways? So are different religions competitors where one's right and the others are wrong, or are they the way different cultures see the truth that lies at the surface of them all? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a huge question. Unfortunately, um, uh, we're at the end of the time for this podcast, but I will say, uh, just to, to respond to that, uh, I think there's there's an aspect that, there that we need to explore. I do think the religions have great commonality, but they also have some 
contradictions and irreconcilable differences. And so what we're trying to do, uh, one of the things I do is work for the Foundation for Religious Diplomacy. And we're saying, let's not ignore our differences. Well, let's talk about our differences and commonality, but let's learn how to fight better. Let's learn how yeah. to argue better in respectful kinds of ways. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's a healthy form of what we call contestation for truth. And I think we need humility along the way. And I think one of the tools to do that is uh, for us to all to tap into uh, disciplines like social psychology to help us understand what's going on in our psychologies uh, as yeah. we disagree over truth. So that, that, that doesn't completely answer your question, but with the time limitation, oh, I have. Not an answer, right? You know, yeah, it really yeah. is not a yes or no. It's right. something to ponder. Yeah. Whether, you know, I mean, I just like to think of the, the idea that people in different parts of the world coming from different cultures come to know life in different ways, but there's some core truths. And even, you know, even, even if you want, if a person wants to argue that their truth is sort of better than the other people's truths, I think it's still useful to think about what's shared. Oh, yeah. what is, you know, why is it that the idea of compassion is something that you find in all the world's religion? And I know there's going to be people out there saying, yeah, but there's this quote I read, you know, from a religious leader. And you can find those quotes from leaders of all religions. Oh, uh, it's 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 not specific to anyone. I, I you know my view, you know, again, no need for people to agree with this, is that there's some value in all in all these things. And you know, we're better off if, you know, just in terms of how how we're gonna move forward as a as a people into the future, we're gonna do a lot better if we focus on what we share than what we're different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. And uh, I wish we had more time to unpack this. And I appreciate you taking the time. You said before we started recording here, you usually don't talk to an audience like this, but I appreciate, I think they need to hear these kinds of insights. Um, so I appreciate you being a guest on the program. Thanks. I, I really enjoyed it. You're a really interesting guy to talk with. Well, thank you. Uh, again, uh, my guest has been uh, Professor Tom Pazinski, and he is the uh, co-author with Sheldon Solomon and Jeff Greenberg, a great book in the wake of 9-11, The Psychology of Terror. If you're watching on YouTube, that's what it looks like. And uh, in the program notes, we'll include uh, a link to uh, Dr. Pazinski and his work, as well as a link to the book. And I would encourage uh, everyone who wants to understand how America was traumatized, uh, particularly uh, communities of faith and how that may influence and shape uh, some of the negative attitudes that we have towards other faith communities, particularly Muslims and how it continues to impact how we do politics and relate to each other, uh, seek out these kinds of resources. Uh, I'm John Moorhead, the host of the Multi-Faith Matters podcast. Thank you for watching and listening until the next episode.